Welcome to Friends and Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories. Novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, and Patty Callahan Henry are four longtime friends with more than 70 published books between them. Together, they host Friends and Fiction with author interviews and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing to highlight and support independent bookstores. They discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Hello, everyone. It is Wednesday night. And that means it is time for Friends in Fiction. It is the happiest night of the week. And tonight, we are so excited to introduce you to Cynthia Dupree Sweeney. I am Patty Callahan Henry. I'm Mary Kay Andrews. I'm Kristen Harmel. And I'm Christy Woodson Harvey. And this is Friends in Fiction. Four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories to support independent bookstores. Our guest for the evening is Cynthia Dupree Sweeney, the author of The Nest and most recently Good Company. And I cannot wait for you to meet her and talk about this extraordinary book. We'll talk about theater, changing careers in midlife, and all of her inspiration for this creative book. As you know, we encourage you to support independent booksellers when and where you can. And one way you can do that is to visit our own Friends in Fiction bookshop.org page where you can find Cynthia's books and books by the four of us and our past guests at a discount. Of course, at bookshop.org, a portion of each sale through the Friends in Fiction shop goes to support independent bookstores and it also helps support our show. So if you enjoy watching, this is a great way to support guests, independent bookstores, and friends in fiction all at the same time. And have you heard about our exciting partner this month, Butterball Turkey? Um, we are especially excited about this because it means we get to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the famed turkey talk line all month long. We talked about it in November, we're talking about it in December, and the talk line is open both months, which is great. So you can call them now if you have a question about how to cook your well, turkey. Not in the middle to... of the show, or... no. Yeah, no, no. wait till the not show's now. over. It's really, really, really interesting, but yeah. after the show, yeah. Yeah, there so you go. Make, make sure to join us on our Talk in Turkey with Butterball after show tonight. We'll be chatting about the history of the Turkey Talk line, and we'll be mentioning some of our favorite turkey recipes. Before we get rolling tonight, we want to make sure you know about, wait, did I jump the gun, nope. Christy? Nope. Nope. Okay. Good. Before we get rolling tonight, <laughs> we want to make sure you know about our divine 12 authors of Christmas extravaganza. And that is not overstating it. We've invited eight amazing author guests to be part of our special Christmas party episode on Wednesday, December 15th, which is, by the way, next week. I can't Together believe with, it. I know, I next know. week. That wow. isn't, that isn't, I can't. Um, Together with the four of us, we're giving all of you a shot at winning all 12 of our books this holiday season. The entry deadline is midnight on Thursday, December 16th. One lucky winner will be chosen at random and announced on Friday, December 17th. That winner will receive a series of 12 different book packages in the mail. One personally sent from each author. Be sure to tune in to our live show next Wednesday night at 7 on the Friends in Fiction Facebook group page and on our YouTube channel. And you can find the entry form on our Facebook page. So don't forget, you can't win it unless you're in it. <laughs> you win it unless you're in it. I think that you just made a new hashtag. You really oh, did. That was a Georgia lottery commercial. I hate to break oh, it. Oh, no. I saw well, it. We'll give you credit. We really liked it. Um, yeah. Also, super exciting news. You guys have been asking, and we are indeed going to have a spring Friends and Fiction box. Yay! Hooray! <laughs> So um, it's going to include My The Wedding Veil, which releases on March 29th, and Mary Kay Andrews' The Homewreckers, which releases in May. It will come with a snazzy free gift to be announced. It's going to be a big surprise that will blow your mind as soon as we pick it. Um, and also, <laughs> if you order before <laughs> December 24th, not only will you get 
your free fun surprise in your box with the wedding veil, but you will also get this really great Seasons Readings ornament that you can see here in the corner of your screen, which is super cute. So that and your other free gift, if you order before December 24th, will come in your first box with the wedding veil. Um, and if you order after December 24th, you'll still get your fun surprise. And best of all, our books. We're Yay. so excited. <laughs> Yay. Um, you can order from Oxford Exchange, and we will have a link on our Facebook page. I'm so excited. I know so many people have been asking. So this is great. All right, y'all. We want to introduce you to our guests. New York Times bestselling author, Cynthia Dupree Sweeney. Cynthia's debut novel, The Nest, spent more than six months on the New York Times bestseller list. It's been translated into more than 27 languages and optioned for film by Amazon Studios. I wonder if she'll tell us any of the movie secrets about it. Ooh. So exciting. The novel mm -hmm. was also named one of the best books of 2016 by People, The Washington Post, The San Francisco Chronicle, NPR, Amazon, and Refinery29. Additionally, her second novel, Good Company, was a read with Jenna pick for April of this year. Wow. Previously, she worked as a copywriter in New York City for more than two decades, writing copy for a variety of clients. Cynthia holds an MFA from the Bennington Writing Seminars, and she now lives in Los Angeles with her husband and sons. Awesome. Sean, will you bring Cynthia on to join us? Hi, Cynthia. Uh, hi, hi, Cynthia. Hi, everyone. Hi, Cynthia in LA. We are yeah. so happy to have you here. I have to tell you, I loved this book so much. It made me miss the theater even more mm -hmm. than I already do. Yeah. Oh, wow. The peek behind the curtain. See what I did there? The peek <laughs> behind the curtain of theater and television was amazing, as well as all the characters who I just felt like I knew. I wrote to Cynthia and told her I wanted to have a glass of wine or some coffee with the main character, Flora, in in New York City. So tell us a little bit about Good Company before we take a much deeper dive into its origins and themes and that kind of thing. Sure. So Good Company is a story of um, two married couples who have been friends for a very long time. And uh, three of the four of them are in the theater television world. And um, one of the characters, Flora, um, who Patty wants to have a drink with. Uh, <laughs> you will too when you read it. So. Yeah. Um, uh, I would like to have a drink with her. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and she goes out to her garage one morning and is looking for something. And she finds a, an old wedding ring of her husband's that he supposedly lost many years ago when he was swimming. And it, it should be sitting in the bottom of a pond somewhere. And, um, and it's not. It's in the palm of her hand. So that sort of kicks off um, the story of the ring and what really happened to it and how it impacts uh, the lives of these four people. So good. So you mentioned the ring. So that's the inciting incident. It's not a spoiler. Yes. You just said no, it. it no, it happens first. like on the first page. It happens on the first page. And I mean, the opening line is, I wasn't looking for the ring when right. I found it. It's so great. Um, it made my stomach flip over when I read that. Yeah. Like, yeah. because it meant that everything you thought true might not be true. Right. 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 It, it flips the world upside down. So I know sometimes we can't say, Cynthia, but can you point to a moment for the original spark or the origin of the story or where it, the little seed that began it? Yeah. I mean, the little seed that began it um, started before I even finished the nest. I was on vacation and there was a, a copy in the vacation house of William Stegner's Crossing to Safety, which is a book I love. And I reread it and I thought, why don't people write more books about adult friendship? Because it's mm. such a rich, complicated territory. And that was like the that was like the little spark of the book. And I also knew that I wanted to write about my husband has been a television writer producer for many years. I've sort of been adjacent to that world. I have had friends who um, have become very famous and I've, I've sort of had a front seat to all of that. And I wanted to write about that. 
And, um, and then I was having a really hard time starting the book. I, I sort of couldn't find my way in. And I was on a business trip with my husband and I did something I've never done in my entire life, which was I left my um, engagement and wedding ring in the hotel room oh. and I never got them back. Oh, that's and terrible. Was, well, oh. the really terrible thing about it was that the wedding ring I had been wearing was my grandmother's. Oh. So. It was, and it was also like worthless. It was just a tiny little band of white gold and, um, but obviously priceless to me. Yes. And um, I couldn't, I couldn't stop talking about it. I told everyone and so many people had a story in return of losing, um, you know, a piece of jewelry. Often it was a ring. Often it was from a grandparent who, you know, that meant something to them. And I just thought, oh, maybe that's, Maybe that's how it starts. Maybe Flora mm -hmm. finds a ring. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I started writing that opening scene like that, I, I knew it was going to work. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Isn't it crazy how, how we can have this idea of what we want to write about, but we can't find the door into it? Yes. Right? Yes. 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 Sometimes yeah. I, I think the moral of the story is go on vacation. There you go. go. That's so true. True. But, uh, put your jewelry in the safe. Yes. yes. Okay. Don't leave your jewelry, yes. but go on vacation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I had a yeah. friend who who thought she'd lost the diamond and pearl earrings that her husband gave her 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 big girl jewelry, mm -hmm. and she didn't want to tell him. Mm -hmm. And um, she found it like a year later in the most bizarre place. She'd been she'd been on vacation, and she put it somewhere just bizarre, like in a powder compact or something. Right. Oh. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But for a year, she just did not want to tell him, oh, my God, I, you know, these diamond and pearl earrings that you had made for me, I can't find. Now it's a really sickening feeling it yes. is to lose something yeah. valuable, but especially when it has, you know, that extra layer of emotional attachment, it, yeah. you know, like I didn't want to tell my parents. <laughs> Yeah, of course. <laughs> 60 years old. I was like afraid to tell them. And this is actually a great story because my um I lost them. Um we were at a hotel on the Sea of Galilee. And oh, wow. Wow. I, I I I told my mom the whole story and she said, Where did you lose them? And and I said, At this hotel at the Sea of Galilee. And she said, Oh, that would have made grandma so happy. Because oh. my my grandmother was a very religious person. And um, and then my dad said, um, you know, the only person who never would have cared about that is your grandmother. Every time somebody had something stolen from them, she would always say, well, they needed it more than you did. Oh, so, wow. Well, and, and you know something? Because of that, it's almost like your grandmother gave you a book. She gave you the door into No, book, I know. Right? I, mean, I mean, believe me. Her picture is beautiful. Here she is. Oh, wow. Right I love that. Oh, so that's beautiful. so cool. Wait, I'm oh, backwards, so. I love that. that. Yeah, so so cool. I, have, I mean, I have pictures of her all, all over my office, but yes, I that's do. That's awesome. Uh, feel oh, like she, for you. like her yeah. ring is living in the book. So that makes me Absolutely. happy. She'd well, be so proud, great. I think. Yeah. Yeah. And it'll last even longer that way. Yep. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Hey, Cynthia, the milieu of theater and TV shows was so immersive. Flora's husband starts a theater company called Good Company, and they met in dramatic fashion during a play at Shakespeare in the Park. Her best mm -hmm. friend, Margot, is a TV star on an ER-type show called Cedar. Flora herself is in the business, but she's doing voiceovers. Obviously, you have just told us that you have some background, but would you, mm -hmm. I mean, we know your husband was is you know in the television business, but did you have a background in theater? Um, not unless you count high school. <laughs> <laughs> we count it. We count it if you want it. Sure. Yeah, okay. Well then yes. Um, <laughs> I I love the, I love theater. Um as may be evident in the book. I um I love Broadway. I um I, you know, any chance I get whenever I go back to New York, it's how many shows can I fit in? And um and so that was just a real joy. I have a lot of friends who sort of straddle the world between theater and television or theater and film. And I bought a lot of people lunch and asked them questions. And that was really, it was so much fun. I, I just loved 
uh, writing all of that stuff because I cared about it so much. And, um, and you know, I went to New York one, uh, one weekend when I was sort of in the middle of the book and I took a, 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 a workshop one Saturday with a woman who is the director of Hades Town. Oh. And, um, and that was really fun because it was just soaking up the atmosphere of all these young people. And I was in a, a rehearsal studio space, which I had never been in before. <coughs> Excuse me. And, um, and I went to Shakespeare in the Park that night and someone in the audience got sick. And so, you know, just ding, 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 like all those little things that you do um, that you never know if they're going to be really helpful. But of course, they are always helpful in mm. pulling details and, um, you know, having inspiration, just walking around the park that night uh, or sitting there in the audience and listening to the noises around me and all of that stuff. So it was all that stuff that went into the book was was really fun and joyful to write. Okay, I have to ask you, do you have a favorite play? A Broadway play? play? Oh, Broadway. man. That is really hard to answer. I mean, I'm a huge Stephen Sondheim fan. I know. And, um, and so probably my favorite, um, my favorite work of his is Company, which I've never seen. I, I, know. I had tickets for the revival on March 17th, 2020. Oh, and, no. Uh, so oh. We know how that worked out. Oh, yeah. no. You but guys, Ron is going I to see going. it uh, next week in, uh, in uh, yeah. New York. We're going, I'm going in the spring. So oh, um, great. I'm, but, um, and, and then in terms of, I'm, I'm trying to think, I mean, I've seen, you know, I loved Wendy Wasserstein's plays when she was alive. Um, I, I'm trying to think if there's um, a specific show that I've really loved. No, I just, I just love the whole experience of being in the audience and it's always so moving to me whenever a whenever a show starts i always get a little weepy um, I do too. when the overture yeah. starts and the music yes moves. yeah i just it's even like, if it's, it's not a sad one you can just yeah. like you feel yeah, it no, it's 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 a, <laughs> I, I i mean for me i think it's about these people who go on stage every night and make themselves so vulnerable yeah. you know, in the name of making something and then do it again the next night and do it again the next night. It's just, you know, it's, I have so much admiration for it. I always think about how many years and how much of their life they've dreamed of that moment and like how hard it is to be that very, very few that make it to that place. So right. I agree. I think the last play I saw was Mean Girls and which like clearly there's yeah. nothing sad about Mean Girls, but even still you just have that feeling of like, Wow, you know that might have yeah. been the last one I saw too, Christy. Really? Funny. Yeah. The last one I saw was Dear Evan Hansen, and oh, it was like so a week that one. before the world shut down. Yep, that oh, was wow. the Mean Girls was right before the world shut down. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it was like two weeks. Yeah, there's something just special about being in a theater audience too. I it think, is. yeah, because it's yeah. just this collective energy of mm -hmm. you know we're here because we're ready to believe what you're what you're telling us and what you're performing, yep. and it, it's a different energy than you find in a movie theater. I think, which is a yeah. more yeah. casual viewer experience. Mm -hmm. It feels very intimate, and there's I don't know, I, I love it. Well, I just, it's I an love exchange. That experience. It's you're like an emotional exchange. exchange. <laughs> like you're part of the show. Yeah. You know, every audience is different and brings something else to the show. Yeah. And so, you know, when that and when that happens, um, I'm thinking of seeing three women a few years ago and just like that, um, you know, when an audience is sort of wrapped like that in the, in the face of these amazing performers, yeah. you can feel it. You can just feel the energy in the room. And it's there's I don't think there's anything like it. I think Meg just reminded me that I was wrong. The last show I saw was with Meg. We went to see Come From Away in February. Oh, right. Yeah, right. That's oh, got it. Oh, and that's I awesome. we both walked out of there just boohooing. Oh, oh yeah. Sure. That's an emotional yeah. one. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So, Cynthia, uh, back to talking about your book for a minute. So, Flora tells most of the story, and we mm -hmm. meet her first, but there are a few shifting points of view. So, the best friend, Margot, and a few surprising other people also kind of have a chance to mm -hmm. give us the story from their perspective, right? Like give us mm -hmm. their viewpoint. So I loved hearing the other voices because my opinion changed with each narrative. And I think that's, I, I like books that do that. I like that, mm -hmm. um, 
books that deal with a shift in perspective, because I think that has so much to do with real life, right? Where we right. have, where we have enough empathy to listen to someone and our views might change a little bit as we find out about someone else's hurts and motivations. So my question is, did you always plan to do this shifting perspective? Um, or did it happen as you came to know all the characters and sort of realized they all had different things to bring to the table? I always felt from the beginning, like this book was going to need that because you had a secret being revealed that and there was more than one person complicit in the secret and and so i felt like you were going to have to hear <coughs> excuse me you're going to have to hear from at least a few different people yeah. um that just seemed like essential to yeah. getting it right was there a narrator in that mix that you liked best or that was most interesting oh to write? yeah i mean i the daughter ruby was Oh, she's so great. <clears throat> I'm sorry, my allergies have been so bad. Oh, and that's when I'm going to have a little frog in my throat. Um, uh, I loved writing Ruby. She was the easiest to write. Uh, okay. I don't have this experience very often, but whenever I had to write her, it was like she just came and sat down in my office and started talking. Oh, that's and, so awesome. and it was... Um, yeah, it was, so much, it was so much fun to write her. And... Um, and I and I still I still think about her. So um, yeah, I know there's always a little part of me that's like, do I have to revisit Ruby at some point in time? Maybe I do. I don't know. But she, yeah, she sort of still nags at me a little bit. That was just fun. Um, my friend Ruman Alam, who wrote Leave the World Behind, finished the book and he texted me and he said, I feel like you wrote yourself the daughter you never had. Oh wow, <laughs> oh, that's wow. interesting. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure my daughter wouldn't be that cool, but sure. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, well, I think one of the things that interests all of us so much and probably will interest a lot of our viewers as well is that you made this really amazing midlife career change to fiction writing. So you're working in marketing and branding. You got your MFA um, and then at 50 moved across the country. So mm -hmm. can you tell us about that journey and what that was like for you? Well, the first thing that happened was we moved to Los Angeles and um, my kids were getting older and I didn't like the work I was doing very much. And it was also changing a lot. And I felt like I had to figure out what I wanted, like what I wanted to do, what I wanted to, how I wanted to spend my time, what I wanted to work at. And I, I sort of tiptoed into writing fiction. I had tried in my 20s. I didn't stick with it. Um, and after doing it a little bit, because I've been a writer for so long and written so many different kinds of things, I knew that I wasn't getting it right. And I knew that someone could teach me basic craft stuff that I wasn't quite understanding. So I decided to do the MFA program then. And that was really great. I really wanted to put that pressure on myself yeah. to produce a lot of work in a short period of time, because I felt like if I don't like it or if I can't do it, I really don't have a lot of time to figure out what the next thing's going to be. So that ended up being... Um, I mean, life changing. I started the nest at the very end of that program, and um, I could never have imagined what what would happen when when I published the nest. Uh, it was nuts, but um, I'm really grateful for it. Hmm. Now, did you do a remote program, or did you go back to? It's a low residency program, okay. which okay. I did at Bennington. So you do right. go back and forth. So. I remember the first residency getting there and realizing that I was going to spend, you know, almost two weeks just reading oh, and man. talking I'm about fiction now. and going to craft sessions and lectures. And I just thought I am have landed in heaven. Yeah. Like, I, awesome. I could not I could not believe how exciting it felt. Well, and that's such an interesting perspective, too, because I'm sure, you know, it changes when you are a little bit older and you know this is something I really want to do. I think you yeah. cherish those experiences a little bit more yeah. as opposed to being, you know, 22 and being like, oh, my gosh, right. I have more homework. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. No, absolutely. I, I was I was very I took it very seriously. I worked very hard 
I, um, you know, part of the Bennington program is that you read quite a lot. And I would, I remember just sitting here in my office thinking, I can't believe my job is to read all day. Like oh, this is, you know, this is so amazing. Cool. This is amazing. So. Oh, I love that. Um, well, do you have any advice for people who, I mean, maybe don't necessarily want to be writers, but who are kind of approaching that point where they think, ah, oh, I've been in this job for a long time. I don't know if I right. want to change. Like, how did you get the courage to do that? And what would you say to other people who wanted to do the same? Well, you know, I started very small. I, um, uh, it really started when a friend of mine wanted to start a writing group and I thought I can't write fiction, I, but I can write nonfiction. And I gave her something that I had written and she said, I think you should write this as a short story. And I, I was like, what do you mean? Like, I don't, I don't write fiction. And she was like, well, you just take this and you add things to it that aren't true. That's <laughs> <laughs> a great perspective. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, I started in a small group with a small group of friends. I think, you know, being with people who are trying to do the same thing and getting feedback is crucial. That was also, I don't think anyone needs an MFA to be a writer. I think it was right for me at that point in my life. And one of the main reasons was, was because I was getting regular feedback on what I was doing. And um, and the first thing I did was take, um, take some evening classes at the UCLA Writers Extension. And so, you know, it felt very, it felt very low stakes. Like I could, I could sort of wait in, I could, I could gauge myself against other people. I could get teacher feedback. I, you know, it was, it was just, I, I, I do think it's, if you just try and do it all by yourself, it, it's going to, yeah. it feels very overwhelming and hard. Yeah. yeah. That's great advice. But there are so many places, especially now um, with the internet and especially now that we've gotten so good looking at each other on the internet, you know, there are so many writers groups and small community centers that offer you know, that kind of support. I think it's, yeah. I think it's pretty easy to find. Oh my gosh. Did you see this comment that just came in? Teddy McMahon Pruitt just finished my first novel at 73. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Amazing. Yeah. Congrats, Teddy. Yeah, that is Yay. fabulous. I mean, I think all of us, it's been a second career. Yeah. Um, so novel writing. So it's always yeah. fascinating to hear, you know, the, the transitions to it. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk about the ending for a minute. We're not going to okay. give it away. I will not give away the ending, but I have to say that I could see many, many endings coming. And as with the best endings, the ending was also a beginning. Um, so from the first draft to the last, did the ending change or did you always know where you were headed? I, I didn't know where I was headed. Ah, uh, good, okay. And I will tell you, I put off writing the ending literally yeah. until the minute I had to. I wow. I wondered um, when I was reading it, I was like, how is she going to get there? Yeah. Yes, me too. <laughs> <laughs> so a year and a half wondering how I was going to yeah. get there. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, I always knew, um, I knew that I was going to have this scene that took place up in the summer artistic colony. Yeah. I was very worried about writing it. And yeah. um, so I really and I switched editors in the middle of the book. So I ended oh, up wow. sort of revising the first mm. two thirds of the book. And then the book was due and quarantine hit and everything shut down. And I was like, all right, Cynthia, sit yourself down and write that right. scene. Yeah. And so I really I didn't write it until I had until I had revised pretty much the book up until that point, and then I wrote it. And then I and then I wrote it very I wrote it very quickly, and because I've been thinking about it for so long, and um, yeah. So that well, it's like I said, it's it's one of the it's a fantastic ending, and like I said, it was also a beginning and rounded itself out, and it felt like you had had given it some really deep thought and I could 
Yeah. Some might say too much thought, but no, there's no such thing. Never too much. No such thing. <laughs> Never too much as long as you actually finish, right? Like, right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Book. True, true, true. <laughs> Cynthia, there's also, um, again, without giving anything away, I noticed that there is kind of a heart motif throughout, starting with Margaret's yeah. husband, who's a pediatric cardiac surgeon. Was uh -huh. that on purpose? Like, did you start with that or was it something well, that grew from the Well, no, story? you know, it's one of those things where, um, like, I knew Margot played a doctor on TV and then I just thought, oh, her husband should be a doctor in real life. Like, wow. that'll be fun to play with. Yeah. And, and then I, I, I made him, I think you find out pretty early in the book that he'd had a stroke at no. some point. And so... I I wanted him, I wanted the work he did to sort of relate to what happened to him. Yeah. Um, because as I was researching strokes, you know, it, it's like, there's all these coincidences in life that sometimes are too neat to even put in a book. Yeah. But, um, but I just kept reading again and again about this particular condition that sometimes doctors have that who treat stroke patients. So anyway, that's sort of how that all happened. And then, um, and yeah, and then I just, I, I found sometimes I would just be researching things and a little, like a little heart, something would pop up and I would think, oh, I have to use it. So I, oh, that's awesome. you know, try not to be heavy handed with it, but it was kind of fun. Oh, it wasn't that's awesome. it was beautiful. It was hidden in there. They were little, Little little secrets tucked away in yeah. the book. It was maybe awesome. that maybe that was your grandma, right? Like who gave you yeah. like the little yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. She kept yeah. popping up with these little hearts along the, the way. Mean, yeah, I love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's amazing. So we have a really active community, and we're right now on Facebook and YouTube, and they're tossing questions in and comments. So Mary Kay, mm -hmm. will you grab one? Yes. Uh, well, one comment I really liked was. Um, Bonnie May said her husband was in high, lost his high school ring in Vietnam, washing his hands and his helmet out in the field. Oh, wow. wow. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you could do a whole thread about. Losing I was just going to say, I sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about you, Kristen? No sure. Um, yes. Yeah, Susan Schwartz Seligman would like to know, Cynthia, were you a reader growing up? Uh, and which authors and books inspired you as a child? Yes, I was a voracious reader growing up. Um, I had to be yelled at to go outside and get some sun. <laughs> and, We've all been there. Um, <laughs> yes. And um, I, I loved the Anne of Green Gables books. Um, mm. We would... Uh, I grew up in Rochester, New York, and we would go to Toronto on vacation. And the first, like the first couple of Anne of Green Gables books you could find anywhere, but it was much harder then to find the rest of them. There's like, I don't know, seven maybe. And so every year we would get there and I would just bug my mother to go to Eaton's and we go to the bookstore and I'd buy the next one. And I would sit in the in the hotel, like gym locker room, you know, reading it. So uh -huh. I loved, you know, I loved that. I loved... I loved um, the Secret Garden. I loved, you know, Laura Ingalls, Laura Ingalls Wilder. I, I like. I loved every. I loved most books that most kids love. I, but I would read anything. I would literally read anything. From, you know, I'd push myself. My parents would let me read anything. So there, there's a picture of me, and I'm probably 12 years old, sitting at a little cabin in Maine. Um, reading Philip Ross, the great American novel. So oh, that was what my dad had read. They they would let me read anything I wanted to read. And um, and so that was great. Oh, that's um, amazing. How about you, Christy? Uh, well, this is such a nice comment. I wanted to read it to you. Marlene Waters said, Cynthia is just so down to earth and personable. I'm so happy to be watching this program. Completely agree. Oh. Um, and... I should not have done that because I lost my question. No, <laughs> Lisa Armstrong wanted to know. I love this one. What was the most exciting part of being a read with Jenna Pick? Oh, I want to know. Well, well, being told that you're a read with Jenna Pick I mean, is a pretty good day. It's like a pretty good not day. a bad day, right? Uh, pretty good day in a pandemic when you're freaking out that no one's going to 
buy your book. Yeah. So um, I, I mean, um, the whole experience was great. And, and the thing I think I enjoyed the most was after you're on the show in the morning, you do an Instagram live with Jenna. And I think we talked for almost an hour and wow, she wow. is a real, she is a real reader and, yeah. and she loves books and she's so thoughtful. Um, she, you know, she just had, she goes deep on every book. This is not a vanity project for her. It is uh, a passion. And so it was a, just a really wonderful experience that I am so incredibly grateful for. I am. Um, cool. I watched um, when they interviewed you on the show part, not the mm -hmm. Instagram on the show part. And um, they just always do such a good job getting to the heart of what the story. Is yeah. About. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're. I mean, they're terrific. It's such. And a you were like cool as a cucumber. I would have been like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> you would not have. You would no, know. no. When um, we see you up there, Patty, you're gonna be cool as a cucumber. I'll be cool like, as a cucumber. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Just like, what do you guys want? I don't know. <laughs> I'm on the Today <laughs> Show like are. most of yeah. the time. Like whatever. It's, it's much easier when you don't have to worry about what you're wearing from here up. Exactly. That's, That's so true. true. Exactly. True. All right. Well, Debbie Cooperman Stone wants to know: Do you plot or do you free write? Do you outline? Do you go for it? No, I am. I'm just sort of. I just sort of go. Um, although this book, I'm, uh, the new the new book I'm working on, I. Um, I did an event with Elizabeth Strout a few weeks ago for her new book, and she said that her writing practice is uh, thinking about all the scenes that have to take place, and she writes them all down, and then she starts writing the scenes, and then she starts thinking about how they're going to connect. And I thought that sounds kind of interesting. Maybe I'll try that. So I've been, I've been kind of trying wow. that, just trying to think about scenes um, instead of just starting to write and sort of groping my way through the dark. So we'll see if it we'll see if it works. I like that. That's I started trying I that. Friend. Yeah. I started trying that with a book that I'm revising right now, and um, and I'm a total pantser, uh, yeah. but I usually write in a very linear way. And what happened to me was I couldn't remember what happened when, so I had right. to subtitle. I had to give subtitles to the chapters, which I'd never done before. Mm -hmm. and that kind of that kind of help, I think. I mean, I think writing Good Company was so difficult because I went back and forth in time with all these different yeah. characters, and it it was it was torture. And yeah. I have such a desire to impose some kind of structure on this new book before I start writing it, just so I'm not in that place again for two and a half years. I don't want to do it that way again. Um, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Interesting. That's awesome. It is an interesting. I've, I've, I've heard people tell me they make a list that they don't even start writing until they have a list of 40 scenes. Wow. That they Ooh. See. It's a very I'm nice like, screenwriter -y way to do it. I, think. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah. it's like screenwriting. Yeah. I just literally don't know until I start writing. I, don't know. I can't right. even make myself yeah. come up with it because right. I just don't know. Like right. it's really bizarre, yeah. and like I, well, I want one to. scene is predicated on the one that came before. Somebody yeah. had right. something, and then I don't know. I don't I know. Don't right, know. I know. <laughs> Writing is hard. <laughs> Writing is hard. <laughs> I know. I know. So speaking of hard, Cynthia, one of our favorite parts of the show is the segment where we get to ask you for a writing tip. So, do you have one you can share with everyone? Well, I think one that people sometimes don't think about, especially beginning writers or early writers, and that is so much fun and so interesting is doing research. So um, I, I, you get so much from it. Yeah. I am, um, I'm working on a new book that I think is going to take place in the late seventies. So I've been watching old Phil Donahue episodes. <laughs> oh, and, oh my uh, gosh, that's awesome. Oh, but fun. I mean, it's fantastic. I, you just come, you just come, you come out of those sessions with a bunch of ideas. Obviously they don't all stick, but it really helps, especially at the beginning of a book to sort of get, you know, to get the wheels turning. And and it's so easy to do now. And so um, 
research. And I also, I've never written a book that's not contemporary. So I reached out to uh, some of my peers and said, what kind of research do you like to do? What really helps? Um, the Phil Donahue show was um, Lou Bayard's tip. So, um, so yeah, so, um, you know, ask for ideas and, uh, and, and just do research. I, I mean, for good company, I listen to podcasts, I read books, um, I watch documentaries, you know, all that stuff almost yeah. feels like you're cheating, yeah. but it does really sort of help you build that world. Mm. You know, and I, I find, I think sometimes people think, well, if I'm doing the research, I'm not doing the writing, but you yeah. are because your brain yeah. is working on it. You're, right. you know, you, your characters are developing and you're seeing right. story trajectories that weren't there before. So mm -hmm. it is, I think it's a vital part of the writing process. I think that's a great tip. I know, um, but you know, Kristen, lots of times when we're doing our writing sprints in the morning, Kristen will say, well, I'm not writing, I'm researching. And we have to say, no, you're, you're that actually. That is true. So, so yeah. we see that the student has learned. I, you've said it to me now so many times. I'm regurgitating it <laughs> on screen. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, really? I was writing that whole time. Exactly. <laughs> well, I always, I, I used to have a, a little post-it on my, on my um, bulletin board behind my computer that said, thinking is writing. Yeah. Uh, because, or thinking is working. Because sometimes I just sit there and I, always have like stick it, you know, um, post-its or something up there. And sometimes I'm just staring at them, waiting for something to come out. And I finish and think, oh, I didn't get anything done today. And it's like, no, I did. Of course I did. Like I moved that ball yeah. a little bit. It doesn't, maybe it's not, a, the, the word count didn't change, but that doesn't mean I wasn't working. That is so true. Absolutely. That's true. Cynthia, do you have a book you'd like to recommend tonight? Something you've read recently? Well, oh, yes, I'm going to recommend right? Elizabeth Strout's new book, Fantastic. Oh William. So mm. it's really, it's really beautiful. It, it's, um, it's part of a trilogy. So if you have read Lucy Barton, yeah. I don't remember the name of the middle one, but they all sort of stand alone. You don't have to have read the previous ones. It's great if you did, but um, this is also about marriage and about. Um, uh, it's about a woman who goes on a road trip with her ex-husband uh, looking for something. And it's just like all of her books, it's sad and funny and wise. And mm -hmm. so that's that's uh, one of my recent favorites. That's great, good recommendation. I haven't read it yet, but I loved um, Lucy Barton. I just, yeah. yeah. one of my favorite lines comes out of that book where, where she said, where the writing teacher tells her, don't worry about, what you're writing. We all only have one story and we tell it over. And yes. Over. <laughs> yeah. It's about knowing what our one story yes. is. I think about yeah. that line in her book all the time. Yeah. I've always hoped I could meet her and tell her that that line was like, yeah. I love that line. I love that That's line. Awesome. Yeah. So, okay, Cindy, if you don't mind sticking around for a few more minutes, we have one no? more question for you, sure. but we have a couple announcements. All right. Okay. Yes. I want to tell you about, remind you about our writer's block podcast. We'll always post links under announcements each time a new one drops. I just love saying that. It sounds so show busy. Really you are so busy, Stop. baby. You I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> a new episode drops each Friday. <laughs> Ron and Patty talk with Kimmery Martin about medical fiction. And this week, Ron talks reality TV with Amy Phillips. And, you know, we remind you every week, but the Friends in Fiction official book club is so much fun. Mary Kay just joined them earlier this week to talk about the Santa suit. Christy's joining them December 20th to talk about Christmas and Peachtree Bluff. Um, it's just it's just so much fun. They're almost up to 10,000 members. As you know, it's run by Lisa Harrison and Brenda Gardner. It's a separate group from us. Um, but I think they just keep getting better and better. So join the book club if you haven't already. They have some great picks coming up. Um, and I can say that now because they're picking books that are not just our books. It used to sound... Yeah you know, a little conceited before when we were like, wow, they have picks from four <laughs> great authors. <laughs> but now they're branching out, which is wonderful. And we also want to make sure that you join us next week, right here at 7 p.m., where we will be celebrating the holidays with not one, not two, 
but eight guest authors. Apologies to Sean, who will have to be negotiating, bringing them on and off. Realizing Bless now, you. I don't think I've mentioned to Sean yet that we're doing this. So Sean, um, buckle up. This is what we're doing next week. They'll this is way worse poem. than what I asked him earlier. <laughs> <laughs> you thought you were mad at me, Sean? I mean, what about her? <laughs> You've already forgiven Christy. Done and dusted. <laughs> There's also going to be a poem and a big giveaway. You will not want to miss this one. And then on December 22nd, just a few days before Christmas, we will host Marie. Maria Amparo Escandon. If you are ever wondering about our schedule, it's always on the Friends in Fiction website. And the fall schedule is on our Facebook banner, and we're going to be announcing some upcoming dates soon. Now, does anyone have anything worse to tell Sean? <laughs> no, I you win. You win. Well, you win. I just have to say, I mean, I know this is preaching to the choir because everyone who's watching is here right now, but do not miss next week. It's Kristen has really outdone herself on this, and it's really something. It's probably the coolest thing we've done since the Forest of Vanishing Stars, the musical. I really, I think so. I mean, it's different because Forest of Vanishing Stars, the musical was a little more like serious. This is a little funnier, but it's equally as amazing. She has such range as a theater writer and producer. Barbara so. Logic just said, Sean is busy next week. He forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara, shame on you. Well, Barbara's going to be filling in. I think that's what she was saying. <laughs> Nobody can fill in. There's just but, no way. No way. Um, while you are on the Oxford Exchange website ordering the new spring box, uh, make sure that you add one of our beautiful new reading journals um, for yourself or someone that you love. We have this blue linen cover, this gorgeous gold embossing. The inside is incredible. It's like everything that you could possibly think to write down about a book and they make a great gift and you should definitely get one for yourself to um, help with all of your 2022 reading goals. Our, um, our Christmas bundle is also still available that has um, Patty's Once Upon a Wardrobe, Mary Kay's uh, the Santa suit, y'all. I'm like forgetting all of our book names. <laughs> and I my know. Christmas and Peach Street book, as well as the option it. to add um, Kristen's The Forest of Vanishing Stars. It is a really incredible gift for someone that you love or for yourself. Because as we've established, one for you, one for me is a good <laughs> philosophy on this show. And they do really pretty gift wrapping too, right? Like oh. the packaging's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you know, if you need to sh ship a last minute holiday mm -hmm. gift, it's mm -hmm. a good, good spot. Yeah. Okay, Cynthia, everybody on the thing is asking where can they get, speaking of gifts, signed copies of your book or signed book plates? Where's the best place to get them? Um, gosh, that's a good question. I mean, I a lot of the independent bookstores have them, um, but if you want one and your local bookstore doesn't have one, if you reach out to me via my website, I will send you a book plate. Oh, that's awesome. awesome. Wow, that's so yeah. nice. And it's a great Christmas gift, too. Yeah. So we usually right about now, Cynthia, we talk about the values of reading and writing growing up in your mm -hmm. childhood, but you talked mm -hmm. about them a little bit. But mm -hmm. I want to know if you've passed those on to your mm -hmm. kids. Mm -hmm. Like, how have you raised them with reading and writing and story? I mean, your husband being in TV, story's obviously a discussion. In right, your life, right. right. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you know, reading was just hugely important, and uh, I read to them every night. That was what we did before bedtime, and um, and you know, it, it took a while for them to read on their own, and but as soon as they did, that was so. I mean, there was an unlimited budget for books. Like you could you could go into you could go into Barnes and Noble, and you couldn't buy a toy, but you could buy a book, and. Um, and you know, my my son, is, they're both huge readers and my older son is a writer as well. And I told him in high school, uh, I, you know, I, I could have ruined the whole thing by uttering these words. I think you're a writer, but yeah, uh, because he hated writing in high in high wow. school, but wow. but um, but he's a but he's a great writer, and um, you know, he wants to make movies, and and he uh, and and my other son is just uh, an avid reader, and 
you know, so it's a real joy. I mean, when we all, when the four of us go away on vacation, we all just sort of go to our separate chairs and open a book. And that to me is like the That's perfect me. family. That's <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my do they God. Now, do they read your book, Cynthia? They do. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's great. Yeah. Yes. yes. And they're, <clears throat> they're so supportive. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, they're so supportive and so excited for me. And oh. that has been, that, that has been really fun. That's awesome. awesome. I love how I did. It didn't even occur to me to turn a light on in this office. You just like watch <laughs> the sunset so in Los you. Angeles. Oh, but you had such nice fun when we started. With my, yeah, with my and, little, and the um, best part is it just got slowly. Dark. I know. It's just like slowly, yes. dark. slowly dark. Very dramatic. <laughs> All right. The other thing everyone's asking, and I, we really want to know too, because you've only hinted, what are you working on next? Well, I'm in very, very, very early days. So I, um, I mean, I wish I had more information for you, but you don't. <laughs> you get it. You don't. You get it. Um, I think, I think it's a, a going to be a book about um, families. That seems to be the book I write over and over again um, in my hometown of Rochester, New York, Ooh, uh, in the late awesome. late seventies. So, mm -hmm. oh, that's awesome. That's Great. the plan. That's the plan now. That's yeah, that'll I mean. that'll change. I think, <laughs> to, I think people want to know what's going on with the Amazon series. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh okay. Yeah. It's not Gosh, Amazon. Us. It is people um, meaning like, Mary Kay Andrews. Yeah. The, the, um, <laughs> I want to know. <laughs> the, the book was originally at Amazon as a feature film. Ah. It was in development for a long time. There, um, the option came up last February and I took it back because oh, wow. the people who had sort of acquired it had all left and I knew oh, it was just sitting yeah. on a shelf there. Um, mm -hmm. But AMC has optioned it as a limited series. And I oh, just, in fact, I just got the, um, um, we hired a wonderful playwright from Manhattan. That was very exciting uh, to me to write the pilot. And um, she just handed in what I think is the final outline for the pilot that will go to AMC and we'll see what happens. Many, many, many miles to go yes, um, tough, before yeah. anyone gets paid. <laughs> it's, um, it's exciting. It's, it's exciting. Yeah, it, it, is. It, it is exciting. It is exciting and it's fun. And I'm involved exactly how I want to be, which is just giving notes for a change instead of taking them. So that's, oh, that's fantastic. Awesome. What a great feeling. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah, it's fun. It's fun. It's, it's been fun. Thank you so much for spending your evening with us and talking about theater and writing and midlife changes and your amazing books. We're so thrilled that you joined us, Cynthia. Thank you. This has been great. Thank you guys for inviting me. I love that you do this. So happy to be here. Thank All right. Have Thank a beautiful you. holidays. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Thanks, Cynthia. Happy holidays. Bye. Bye. Cynthia. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, now to the rest of you. Make sure you stay around for our Talking Turkey with Butterball after show. And don't forget that you can find all of our back episodes on YouTube. We are live there every week, just like we are on Facebook. And if you subscribe, you will never miss a single thing. Plus, you'll have access to short clips. We pull out some, we pull out the writing tips and some fun things that they say. And be sure to come back next week as we have, as we make Sean crazy. All right, <laughs> well, good night. <laughs>
Yeah. I remember really distinctly going to SIBA and getting an advanced copy of The Nest and being like, yeah. this is so, and like reading it and being like, oh my gosh, this is so great. Um, so it's yeah. just, it's really exciting to hear her story and how she made that career switch. It's scary, you know? Yeah. It is. Yeah. We all did it, but um, we didn't yeah. like hop off to MFA school. I think that's yeah. fascinating. Good Me for too. her. Yeah. yeah. She's really inspiring. Absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, and I meant it, I admit, and I know y'all do too, but I miss theater and yeah. reading that book, there's the, you know, kind of behind the scenes of how they choose the actors and actresses, the difference between TV and live theater, the, um, and the show in the book called Cedar is kind of an ER um, playoff ER and, and how people get attached to the characters and what happens if, if one wants to quit, do they kill them? Like, what do they do with them? You know? Right. So, um, I don't know. I, I, I think it's, I love hearing behind the scenes of any job. Yeah. Me too. You know, when we learn yeah. something. It's true. I agree. That's so interesting. It is interesting. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I think I'm going to New York next week, by the way. Oh, you are? Oh, I think so. I think so. If I can get these revisions. Oh, fantastic. Um, Yep. Be and I may, I think, I'm hoping I'm going to hook up with um, Ron and Jeff. They'll be in New York. Oh, of course. No That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, you oh, guys, you feel like they planned something behind our backs? Are you feeling like a teensy week? Let's just go. Out? No. Yeah, what are we waiting on. for? <laughs> the sad thing is that, you know, I, I haven't been to New York like all of you, I'm sure. Yeah, I haven't I been know. in almost two yeah, years. It was. Same. And it's my February most favorite place. Yeah. yeah, and so yeah. I went to look to make a book a room at the place we usually stay at in Murray Hill. They closed it down, and now it's a homeless shelter. Oh, wow. no way. No way. So I'm not staying um, where I used to always stay. Did you find a place? We're definitely going to go to a play, right? Yes, I hope to. That'd I hope be great. I might go see Company. It's on. There's a revival on. Really? I think and, yeah, I think Ron and Jeff are going to go see it, so we'll see. Did y'all see a clip of that um, Lynn Manuel reading from Tick Tick Sight. Boom? Uh, no, it was from um, George George in the park. You know the oh, the Sunny in the park with George. Yeah. yeah. No, and he did know. it in Central in in Times Square right after Stephen right. died, wow. and he. Uh, Oh, wow. Read from his book, and then there was a huge chorus behind him singing. You guys got to look it up. It's a oh, YouTube awesome. clip. And then this huge chorus behind him of famous Broadway stars singing oh, I, a song from Sundays with George. I, I wow. saw a clip of that. Yeah, that's awesome. I didn't I see the whole thing, but yeah. That's it made me get a little bit weepy. Yeah. yeah. Not only for New York, but for plays and for the emotion yep. that they bring yes. and for the talent that's lost when he leaves. And, and yeah, an expense account true. lunches with our publishers. <laughs> yeah, and just while I'm going during Christmas, the window. Yeah. Now I'm kind of talking myself into going. I know. Well, in my, like, my best friend and I always take our kids and we go like, last week or this week every single year and um i'm not going this year and i'm really bummed out and it's so funny because someone from my pub house emailed me and was like i'm really sad this is the week you normally come and i was like yeah. it is the week i don't really come but yeah it's so fun it gets me so pumped up but actually kind of getting to be here and doing all our like silly little small town yeah. traditions have been really yeah. good too so. yeah yeah Three days till I squeeze those babies. Oh, that's going to be so great. I so know. fun. That'll make up for missing New York, but you'll have to send us loads of pictures. Yeah. yeah. Is everybody ready for Christmas? No. Oh, heck no. <laughs> um, I was just freaking out about it today, looking at the list of people I still need to get things for that I. I know what Same. I want to get. It's just I don't have the time to sit down and actually do the ordering and the wrapping. And I've done nothing. Yeah, so, you haven't even finished a book. Yeah, that's true. I have to finish revising it now. Yeah. Well, Christmas and Peachtree Bluff, like the we're doing like a town takeover this weekend. Well, not this weekend. It started today in Beaufort. And um, awesome. so y'all follow me on Instagram because I'm going to be posting lots of pictures. We can't wait. Today. Yeah. And now that we so know fun. the places, we'll we'll be following you. I know, well, you know what's really funny too is um, I started to get nervous because I was like, we're doing all these um, 
bus tours around town. And what if it's freezing cold and like sleeting? I mean, you know, you don't know. It's December and it's going to be yeah. 72 on Saturday yes. and 70 on <laughs> Friday. Crazy. And I'm like, thank you, Lord. So yeah, someone just weird. asked, and we already know the answer because we were going crazy <laughs> with you on text, but they want to know how it felt to be the grand marshal of your town's parade. Highlight of my life. Weird. No, I'm just kidding. It was fun. Little Will rode with me and we handed out candy and um it was just really fun. It's just so, it's so great to live in a really tiny town who will like make a big deal out of your stuff. But um, it's just really nice. Like a lot of people are coming in for it. And um, I don't know, it's just been, it's really cool. So I'm, I'm excited awesome. and um, there are lots of fun events going on and um, I'm going to be really tired on Sunday, but really happy. <laughs> uh, that's I kept amazing. thinking, you know, you wore that really great hat. <laughs> And I kept thinking how much fun it would have been if you would have worn a Cindy Lou Who wig. I have now, one. Who has that? <laughs> I have a Cindy Lou Who wig and it's super like crazy. But I'll tell you something funny. So you know that hat? It's actually a tree topper. Oh, really? No. Yes. Wow. And I've had it for a couple of years. And I was like, this is so cute. I wonder if it would fit on my head. And it like perfectly fit on my head. <laughs> That's so I just kept thinking, if they ask you to be the Grand Marshal again, I want you to wear the Cindy Lou Who hat. Cindy Lou Who. I, I think it could be like a one and done type of situation, though. I'm not sure I you know. get to do it twice, you know? <laughs> but If anybody could do it twice, it would be you. Oh, thank you, Patty. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I cannot wait to see pictures of the babies. I'm so excited. They're coming. And pictures of New York. And gosh, this is going to be like the best Christmas for Noah. I feel like this Christmas <laughs> is so fun. Like it's so, he's, he's such a good excited. age. He's a good age. Yeah. yeah. Are you doing the Christmas Eve like ride around on the monorail and look at the lights? So we're gonna do it um, the weekend before. Um, okay. Yeah, we're excited about it. We have. Are, they're gonna use the Polynesian as our home base. It's gonna be. It's you gonna have be, to we're send pictures of that. I mean, it's For so sure. foreign to us. I know because you yeah. live in Orlando and you have this pass, you go all the time. But yeah, we do. Like, it's crazy. Disney World for us is like this year-long planning and tickets and, so and plane flights mm -hmm. and so i know it's, it's so weird it's so weird when you live here and um and i, I it's like intellectually i know that but right. to me i'm just so used to like we didn't have anything to do on sunday so we well, i mean there were a million things to do but we didn't have anything right. fun to do <laughs> so yeah. we were like we'll just pop over to epcot for a couple hours and so we did that and, oh, you know what i mean crazy. it's just such a normal thing here no. yeah it was so funny like when i was there and i said to Kristen, like so how often do you go to the park? And she's like, you know, a few days a week after school. And I was like, that's just so, I can't even imagine. Cause like you said, Patty, for us, it's like this massive planning yes. and like, yeah. yeah. All right, y'all let's go get our week going. I love to go Wait, we're supposed to talk about Turkey. Oh, Oh, you know what? I made. Oh wait, um, Kristen, you play, you posted something today. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I made it. I actually made it today. Um, I made so it this good. morning um, because I knew, it, like, when we have the show at night, I usually don't make dinner on Wednesdays. But I was like, what if I made the dinner in the morning, photographed it, and put it on online, right? And I then we it. could just reheat it for dinner tonight. So that was perfect. Mm -hmm. It was, like, the perfect thing to do. But I made a, um, a French cassoulet and, like, absolutely a cheating version of it because a real French cassoulet takes days to prepare. It's, it's a really complex dish with, like, beans and duck confit and all sorts of things but um, I made it yeah. featuring butterball turkey sausage which um which is so good I've actually made it that way before we even before we were partnering with butterball because I just like the way that particular sausage works in the dish like it it picks up the flavors without interfering with the flavors anyways mm -hmm. it's really good the recipes on my Facebook and my Instagram um and it's easy it's like a, a good winter dish and um, and Noah will eat cassoulet that's a pretty sophisticated kid he will but um you know his favorite part of it is the the um the turkey sausage so he'll pick mm -hmm. that out and complain about the rest so um <laughs> so tonight I gave him like a side with his cassoulet and that's exactly what he did he just ate the sausage out of it so, I love that that's so cute yeah, yeah. that's Aww. adorable I made turkey tacos last night and I'm gonna go eat the leftovers of those right now so a very sophisticated take on butterballs turkey tacos I, I love turkey tacos mm -hmm. I am headed out to um our Red Mountain Theater holiday extravaganza it's Ooh. a big theater production oh, cool. and they have live animals and Ooh, so oh. how cool I know. so I'm going Darling. to the theater we oh, need I've to get out to the squirrel's nest to cut some more fat out of my manuscript oh Ooh, good for you 
All right. But before we leave all of you and see you next week, just a reminder that Butterball is celebrating the 40th anniversary of its Turkey Talk line. And I hope you didn't call them in the middle of the show. Yeah. And it started <laughs> as just a talk line, but now they have a website and a Facebook page. They're on Instagram and they are on TikTok, which I'm scared to go near. Turkey Talk TikTok. <laughs> Turkey Talk TikTok. Look how good I did that. Turkey Talk TikTok. <laughs> of course, we all know that we can call in um, with any last minute questions or turkey questions. And if you forget to write it down, you can just Google it or go to butterball.com. And we have a little link running across the bottom right now. So good night, y'all. Thank you. Good for night. Having See you next week.